What the truck of the week? I'm Dooner. This is the dude. You know why we get Juneteenth off this year? Freight waves observing it. Yeah, it's about time. It's about this time. is a holiday that should have been around for a while, eh? You know what? Sadly, <laughs> like I'll admit it. Sadly, I only learned about it last year when they started bringing it up. It wasn't taught in schools up in New England where I was. Yeah, no, it wasn't taught in schools in Cleveland where I was either. I really didn't learn about it till this year. And now I think uh, we should have been doing this for quite a while. I feel duped. Yeah, it seems like a, a great observation, a, a great thing to you know talk to your kids about, and also makes Father's Day an extended weekend. So absolutely, I get agree. that going I for us. You Hot know, I feel day. like you're about to Father's Day weekend, good time for some ice cream, and I feel like you're about to uh, belie me with some random facts about grape ice cream. <laughs> How, now, why would you think that? <laughs> I see the weird articles you read. I do read some weird articles. Yeah, so grape ice cream. Why isn't there any grape ice cream, right? I don't There's know. theories all over the place. My personal favorite one is that Ben Cohen of Ben & Jerry's yeah. was back in the day working on uh, ice cream flavors and put some grape together and to impress his girlfriend at that yeah. time, gave it to her. Her dog ate it and died. So it is... Is this uh, true? No, it's oh, absolute okay. malarkey. Because yeah, you can't give grapes to dogs. Apparently, yeah, they they yeah. die or something. It's it's yeah. So that that was one of you. You know, I haven't considered this. So like, there's huh. grape gum. It doesn't taste anything like actual grape. No, there's grape Jolly is, Ranchers. Yeah, it's, but grape grape is a flavor. Like grape flavoring is its own thing. It's not like an actual grape. It doesn't taste no, like it doesn't a grape. Taste grape at all. It's like banana. Strawberry yeah. is pretty bad too. But watermelon. Is, did you ever find out the reason behind all this? So the, according to the experts at Ben and Jerry, because somebody did this research, and it's just it's simply because the high water content makes it very difficult to make grape ice cream in mass quantities. It just turns into ice chunks. It's not creamy, and it's just like crappy ice cream. It would be if you think about Ben and Jerry's too. They put a lot of chunks in there, pretty thick chunks, some frozen grapes. That's not going to be good. Nah, it's not. It's definitely good. not going to be not good. Gonna be good. You know, I'm glad you brought all that up because today we're going to get the inside scoop on ice cream logistics from John Calloway. He's Logic X president. Nice. We're also nice. going to have Trent Broberg on today, CEO of Assertus, and he's going to talk about are the best vehicle logistics companies really tech companies? A question you could ask about general logistics companies too, maybe. Yeah, it absolutely is. <laughs> Brian <laughs> Runnels, director of safety at Reliance Partners. Stay, it's like, don't leave before this interview. I had him on radio. He told me this story before. It's about an accident he got into. In 1996, while driving a truck, and it's an incredible, incredible tale. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Brian Kebesty, founder of Port X Logistics. He's going to be talking about how Port X Logistics is solving air freight capacity issues for shippers. You know, every mode of transportation is a dumpster fire, but he seems to know a way to unlock it. But before we get to all that, we're going to get the inside story on Eric Kulish, what he reported on Monday, we brought to you to you on the show. It's about FedEx Freight. They're pruning, cutting 1,400 less than truckload customers. They did it with almost no notice. It happened yeah. on Friday. People woke up Monday morning scrambling for capacity. Yeah. We're going to bring yeah. up Lance Healy just a second, but first we have to tip the band. This episode is brought to you by Legend Transportation, which has been establishing partnerships through outstanding customer service since 2007. Learn more at Tell em, Dude. Hey, go to newlegendinc.com immediately after the show. Now, let's bring a man of the harp up, Lance Healy. He's the president <laughs> and CIO at Banyan Technologies. Lance, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's a pleasure, guys. Always a pleasure. So, yeah, but uh, so the harp, but like LTL is doing so awesome right now. I just don't feel like you could play the blues for 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 the LTL industry right now. So it's uh, doing yeah. awesome, but we get a happy blues somehow. Well, there's <laughs> gonna, I mean, on Monday, there was 1400 plus customers singing the blues for FedEx. What yeah. uh, what happens in a situation like this? So it's really, I mean, we're looking at uh, an LTL volume and, and, you know, capacity, everything is tight. Everybody's drowning in freight. So they're looking at, hey, I've got a finite amount of freight I can put on trucks, a finite amount I can, I can load into terminals. So where am I going to get the best bang for the buck? Um, you know, I won't even pretend to guess, you know, their strategy on how they're going at it, but I think there's a lot of ripple effect when you have that kind of a public execution of 1,400 customers um, at once that just puts every the entire industry on notice that says, you know, whatever sacred cows you think are out there, you know, we're 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 gonna we're gonna start negotiating pretty hard. Um, yeah. So it's interesting, but it's a it's a tactic. It's a you know, everybody's uh, kind of lining up a little bit more. I think so. 
Yeah, it, it is, Lance. And I mean, you, you, in LTL, you got levers you can pull to do these t these different types of things, right? I mean, embargoes on different lanes and that type of stuff can be easily done through uh, FAK pricing or changes in your direct, indirect, cartage zones, that type of stuff, service standards, Absolutely. that type of thing. But so, they, I mean, this kind of smells like some, they did something that, I mean, this is... A, a, it, it's very aggressive, is it not? I mean, it's odd. It's extremely aggressive, yeah. And I think I think it's going to be a trend that we're going to keep seeing, not to, like, you know, off with their heads, you know, kind of cut them off with 24 hours notice, but I think the 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 aggressive and the uh, the right, you know, the, the progressive uh, LTO companies are going to be taking a really hard look at nobody's out looking for freight anymore. Now it's where do I get the right freight and from the right customers? Um, you mm. know, one of the companies mentioned in the article is Invicare, which is right down the road from me here in, in Cleveland. A great company. They make, you know, big powered wheelchairs and medical devices equipment. It's not great freight. So, you know, any company looking at that and saying, okay, well, what else can I put in the space that's going to occupy that? I, I get it. I mean, I, I get it as a business decision. Probably didn't do anything wrong. It's just they're able to pick and choose. Yeah. Now, I have to imagine um, you talk about this pick and choosing lens. I, I'm not saying 1,400 of these customers were all bad actors, but mm -hmm. some of the freight they don't want has to be in that. Does this put shippers on notice, too, about how they're dealing with their carrier partners? You know, if they're mm. having long dock delays, yeah. they're holding people up. The FedExes of the world are, are trimming customers. You know, is it time to shape up or ship out? Sure. And you look at um, you look in the in the final mile area right now. You have LaserShip that just announced, "Hey, we're not taking on new customers. We're going to work with the ones yeah. we have." Um, you look at Carol at UPS that said, "Hey, you know what? The big companies. We're going to really focus our our market on the small to medium sized businesses because it's more profitable for it." So everybody's starting to trend that way. And, and due to your point, um, the, especially in the LTO carriers, they have a lot more tools that are going to be at their disposal in the next couple of years that they can be very um, choosy, not only on the freight that they take, but who they take it from. So shipper of choice is actually going to mean something. What's my average dwell time? What's my, how many damage claims do I have? How many, you know, what's my remittance performance? All of those things can be taken in because if I'm allocating 15 minutes to be on your dock and off your dock and I'm stuck there for two hours, you're just jeopardizing my, my promise of on-time delivery for all the other customers. So yeah. that's going to that's gonna start playing more and more of a factor. Yeah, it's going to be fun be, to watch. There'll be some good discussions on those 98% uh, discounts on yellow, 92 rates, FAK, 70 <laughs> yeah. on class yeah. 150 to 252, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. But uh, <laughs> but a lot of that is the, the shippers that think that, you know, they carry a big stick and I have all this leverage. That's going to change. Um, yeah. Good for cow bills. May not be as good for LTL for eight. No, Lance, so, where do you go as a customer in this market? Now, you woke up on Monday and found out mm -hmm. you've gotten the ax, you know. Where do you go? What do you do? Um, you know, I'd go to the bar, but the uh, <laughs> you know, for, the um, for the customers, they're really looking at they're they're scrambling. I mean, they they they're calling around to people saying, "Hey, I you know had this much allocation for this," and quite honestly, the networks just aren't there to absorb that. So they're going to feel that bump for a little while, um, you know, and, and working with their other partners to try to take it take up the slack. You're a little bit of damaged goods this week, too, because it's like, oh, you oh, must yeah. be one of those FedEx customers. Well, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you know, I mean, it's the reason. Invicare, Invicare, sorry, right. and I thought about Invicare right away, but then you got like Waltco and, you know, the, the Liftgate yeah. company, yeah. Overhead Door and all those that we used to call ugly freight. And then we'd be reminded there is no right. ugly freight, just poorly priced, right? And yeah. So, um, exactly. No price is good enough right yeah. now, though. Yeah, it's yeah. like trying to, you know, Jeff Bezos trying to buy the Mona Lisa to eat it. Like same as booking LTL freight, just as hard. <laughs> Spin the wheel. <laughs> oh, wheel of stupid <laughs> questions. Yeah. We're doing a wheel uh, of stupid questions. What do we here, got Lance? for him? Man, you put and, a lot of mustard wow, on that. A lot of grape well, ice cream. That, on that, that was one. a good one. Oh, that's and a that's a dealer's choice. Perfect. Dealer's choice is where I landed on. So I'm going to pick this one. Wow. Live events are back, Lance. Live events are back, mm -hmm. and you show up at F3 this November. Yes. Right, November 18th, right hand yeah. of Chattanooga. And as usual, we're at the bar, and you reach for your blues harp. And, but it's not there, my friend. It's not in your pocket. Your friend isn't there. The crowd's waiting for a song from Lance. What do you do, my friend? Um, 
Ooh. Oh, oh. Hit, hit, it, hit it, hit it for us. Give us a preview. <laughs> You know, Beautiful. Let's hey, how do people connect and learn more and get more uh, bongo playing? Uh, yeah, uh, you don't need that. But uh, yeah, you know, BanyanTechnology.com. We're working on the uh, revolutionize some of the LTL pricing. So there's some fun stuff coming down the pipe. Thank be, you so much for time. joining us. Thanks so much for joining yeah, us today, Lance. We All appreciate right, man. It. Thanks, guys. Thanks, you know, Lance. Matthew McConaughey used to play those things naked. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. All, all right. right. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, this is a family show. All right. Brian Kempis, the founder of Portex Logistics, is joining us now. And he's talking, he's going to talk to us about how Portex Logistics is solving air freight capacity issues for shippers. Um, Brian, you, you, can you help out with some LTL too? Um, with that FedEx news that segment we were just talking about. A lot of, so many issues in supply chain. I was surprised you said this topic. You know how to unlock capacity. Help us out, Brian. Kind of. Um, so, <laughs> So we don't provide the actual air freight, but uh, Portex uh, earlier during the pandemic launched something called Carrier 911. And Carrier 911 helps expedite cargo once the freight has landed. Um, and we found there was a, a bit of a void in the, in the market because, um, you know, a lot of air freight, there was no lift capacity into a market like Denver, for example. So you're flying it into Chicago, but you need it in Denver the next day in order to, you know, meet fulfillment or production. Um, so we have developed a network of sprinters, straight trucks and dry vans that re can recover freight at all the major airports and expedite to final destination around the United States. Ah, well, there you did go. you know that, Brian, by the way, Brian comes what? out of Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. Did you know that that is the original hometown of Ted Turner, Coach Jeff Fisher and Vixen lead singer Janet Gardner? Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it's true. I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. What do you yep, Ted, Ted's my neighbor. <laughs> Ted's my neighbor. <laughs> He's your neighbor. Awesome. Hey, now listen. So, okay. So this is what you guys are solving, right? Yeah. Where are you getting this capacity from? You got trucks just laying around or what, what's happening? You know, you'd be amazed. So the reason that we wanted to talk about this today was like, I was sick of talking about, you know, we do a lot of expediting con containerized cargo and ocean freight. And it was like, how long can we talk about that there's, there's a, a lack of capacity on the rail and containerized cargo and all this. Yeah, yeah. So we built this, we, we developed this a couple of years ago and really we kind of sat on it and weren't doing much. And we we've developed the network. We've got a great um, uh, driver matching site that we use that, that we can get these on demand drivers and we get them all GPS tracked. So um, it's, it's just, it's something that we've found in the market that we can execute, um, pretty flawlessly. And in general, I mean, we've got drivers available on demand for something. If, if you send us something, you got two pallets in, in JFK, they need to be in Charleston tomorrow. Um, we are probably going to be on site within two hours. Oh yeah, you're gonna have to be there right away <laughs> to get that stuff moving. Yeah, I mean, Unbelievable. it's, it's incredible. You you even have some customer success stories on your site. You're talking about having to send uh, cargo from Denver to Kitimat, British Columbia, Kitimat, not BC. Yeah, tell us about yeah. that. Air freight manager called and he's like, "I can't get lift capacity out of Denver to Vancouver, and Kitimat's 800 miles from Vancouver. So like, I just need to get this thing there, and it needs to be there by X date, or we have a crew." that is doing an installation that basically is useless. So Shane, who runs our carrier 911 division, had a truck available and on site, I think within 30 minutes, um, the, the driver picked it up, did a direct drive, all GPS tracked all the way through Canada, delivered to Kitimat, success story, POD, signed, sealed, delivered on our turbo driver app um, immediately upon delivery. Wow. So are people a lot a lot of customers taking advantage of this? What's the what's the acceptance rate here? Are people you know... the acceptance rate is is really high because there's a high need both out of airports um, and we're seeing a lot of CFS cargo, container freight station cargo now mm -hmm. becoming immediately hot because they had sent a full container on the rail that got stuck somewhere. Let's say Kansas City or Chicago on a on a transfer, and they're like, well, geez, we got four pallets sitting in a CFS in Los Angeles, let's get that truck to cross the country to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, and that was another example. I want to say um, we delivered 
LA to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, it was 2,144 miles, um, was delivered within two days. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. So in a market like this, right, where every shipment is delayed, so in a sense, every shipment is hot, how do you differentiate between what's hot and what's really, really hot? Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we handle is hot, but for us, we don't handle any LCL. We are exclusive use, direct drive, whether it's on the container side or the over the road slash air freight side. So anything that we get from a customer and they're saying this is coming out of a CFS, wind down situation is hot or air cargo I need to recover immediately. We price it through our carrier 911 model um, because one of our mottos at Port X is if we can't do it perfect, we don't do it at all. So we set it up to, to run flawlessly. And if the clients choose the reliability, the price, the technology, um, you know, then we end up executing the shipment. Wow. So from uh, your vantage point there at, at Portex handling all these types of systems, are, all these, are things getting worse? What, what are you seeing? What else is going on in the market there that you see? Uh, the biggest thing I've seen lately, and we're getting ready to, to, to blow this up on LinkedIn and email blast to all of our customers, is pallets. There is now becoming a pallet shortage, specifically on the West Coast. Um, LA is the first to see it. And LA was also the first to see congestion. So we expect this pallet shortage to continue with a lack of uh, IPI, uh, intermodal uh, service inland. Everybody is transloading this cargo on the coasts. So if you've got a container that's got a thousand cartons of coffee makers, it takes way too much time. I just I was just talking to the warehouse manager in Norfolk, Virginia. And we did a comparison. You have palletized cargo that you need to transload, 20 pallets out of a container into a truck, 45, minute, 45 minutes for one guy. So if we have to palletize 1,000 cartons, get it out, loose loaded, palletize it, reload it, we're talking about two guys for four hours to do the hand unload, palletize, mm -hmm. shrink wrap, plus that you still need half a forklift driver to bring in pallets and move the freight around. So 45 minutes versus 10 man hours. Um, so the labor, which nobody can get, uh, there's a shortage. And uh, the pallets are uh, short supply due to the demand. And by the way, I don't know if anybody's gone to buy wood at Home Depot lately, but I think it went <laughs> up 500% since the start of the pandemic. Yeah, I covered this in the What the Truck newsletter about a month ago. We were talking yeah. about those wood shortages, the pallet Absolutely. shortage, all of this kind of stuff. And it's a problem that still hasn't gotten corrected. It's a one that's kind of controversial, too. People have talked about they're seeing plenty of wood at the lumber yards, but it's the way it's being released. You know, not my expertise, so I'm not entirely sure. But pretty crazy situation. Are you having – you're not turning down business like some companies are, are you? Um, we are highly encouraging – them to bring it over palletized, which we understand many of these BCOs, they can't get containers from overseas. So, you know, when you palletize it, you've got less cubes, so you need more containers. So the BCOs are really, you know, if you're a, a shipper or a consumer, you're really in a tough position because you can't get the containers from overseas, but then it gets here and you can't get pallets and or labor. And it's like, they can't win anywhere. So really the you know, the manufacturers, the BCOs, the retailers over here are just getting hit from from every angle. And uh, we are highly encouraging it come over palletized via our pricing. And we are also telling them we need to allocate um, real estate. We need to allocate drivers. We need to allocate labor, which is very hard to come by now. We have to make sure we have pallets on supply. So if you're not giving us heads up on this loose loaded cargo, um, you could be in jail. And, you know, wow. we're one of the better performers in the marketplace. Um, so I think others are just saying, no, they're just turning it down. But we're we're still doing it, but with some caveats. Wow. I bet they wish that they would have uh, jumped on the bandwagon with those slip sheet loading <laughs> when, when that came here. Right? The, the yeah, non right. But then it gets to a warehouse here. What if you don't have a slip sheet machine? Yeah, it's exactly. I mean, it's not you it, it hasn't uh, proliferated the market enough to even, for that yeah. to even be the solution. Right. Uh, I'd be pushing it hard if I was one of those people, though. I'll tell you that. Hey, Brian, thank you so much for sharing <laughs> your perspective today. People who want to use Carrier 911 or Port X Logistics Services, where should we send them to? Uh, portxlogistics.com 
um, or um, our LinkedIn page, uh, just, just Portex Logistics, um, and we'd be happy to help out or provide market information. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Wow. All right. We got another Brian coming up. It's Brian Runnels, Director of Safety at Reliance Partners. Last time I caught up with him was on uh, our old Freightways radio show on Sirius XM. He told me the story of this accident that happened in 1996. He's mm -hmm. here to tell this audience about it and some of the impacts for both himself and those that were affected by the, the accident. So let's bring him up. Brian, hey, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks, Tim. Glad to be here. It's, it has been. I think it was towards the tail end of last year when we talked. So I've been yeah. looking forward to doing this for quite a while. That was a powerful segment. I'm so glad we're going to be able to, to do this on this medium, too. Um, we, we only have 10 minutes, so let's get into it right away. Tell us a little bit about this story. It's, a, it's about the 25-year anniversary of when this happened, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. It, it happened in 96, and it almost, quite honestly, almost to the day 25 years ago. Uh, it was in June. <clears throat> and it, it, it's a personal experience. It, it wasn't somebody that I was working in a safety department or it was a friend of mine. It was me. And um, I had a bad rollover accident that took out the car that I was trying to avoid. And long story short, it was all due to distraction and reacting the wrong way. So, you know, it's a very powerful story to tell when when I was in a position of training drivers and, and now in the position of going out to carriers and and helping them with their safety uh, initiatives uh, within whether it's a 20 unit company or, or you know, hundreds, thousands, whatever it is, because what it took me a long time to understand was all the, the all the people that one accident affects and more so than. OK, you got the company, you've got the company, the manufacturer, attorneys, you, you've got all that. And, and I'll say first, I'm very, very grateful and lucky that it happened when it did, because it wasn't near as a litigious society as it is now. Um, so the people wanted their medical bills paid for and a new car and probably some money on the other side. And as a a driver two years into my career, I just, I didn't understand um, the ripple effect that, that it took, but now going through my career and, and like I told you then after that accident, I never so much as scratched the paint on anything and, and put 2 million miles on a truck and, and never had another issue since, but coming off the road and going into a safety department going into it, uh, creating a school and creating training program for a carrier, moving to in the insurance side, being on loss control, uh, and now safety on the agency side. I've got a better insight on all the people that this thing affects. Brian, before and, we go any further, Brian, before we go any further, sure. just because I, I don't think most of this audience knows the story. Can you, can you take us back into what happened? Sure. Yeah. Coming across the bridge from California into Arizona on I-10. Beautiful day. Um, first of all, the truck was governed at 65 miles an hour, so it really wasn't a speed issue. Um, but it was too fast for the conditions. A gentleman was parked on the side of the road videotaping people jet skiing and stuff like that down in the Colorado River. Yes, there was water in the river at that time. Uh, he came out onto the freeway. And at the same time, uh, it was 1996, so it was cassette tape time, uh, pushing eject, pulling the tape out, flipping it over, putting it back in. When I looked up, there he was, um, slammed on the brakes, only had maybe three, 4,000 pounds in the box. Of, I was full, but it was just uh, styrofoam cups. And the trailer started to bounce. The tractor went to the left. The trailer went to the right. I slammed into the center median and put it on its on the driver's side. Uh, and then, like I said, as I climbed out of the truck through the passenger door straight up, I looked down and I had wiped that car out as well. Um, you know, and, and I'll say it, it took me a while to realize that, man, that was just 100 percent my fault. You know, I blamed the guy for pulling out. Um, but. I do remember as the truck was sliding sideways before it hit the barrier, I looked to my left and I saw the truck that was in the left lane and he had been flashing his lights like crazy, trying to get me to come out. So that 
10 seconds or whatever it was that it took me to flip that tape over that pretty much that whole time he was there. And I didn't know I had that option to get out. Uh, mm -hmm. By the time it was the time I, I knew it, it was too late. So I hit the center divider over. I went, uh, it's a very surreal feeling to have the driver's side mirror come up, smash through your driver's side door window. And you can watch pavement go by right underneath you. Um, my wife was with me. She fell on top of me. It just so happened. She got up to go to the bunk and she fell right on top of me. So I was holding her up as well from potentially going out that window. Uh, so yeah, it was, that's the long and the short of it. Hey Brian, and what was, what was the cassette tape? Do you remember? I do. I'm a big drum corps international fan and it was one of their tapes. Um, from and in fact when we went to clean the truck out they said you know do you want us to get power to that so you can pull it out i was like yeah no thanks it yeah. can stay right where it was yeah um so it, it 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 changed a lot of things about the way i drove about the way um the way i feel about trucks that i see barreling down the road following somebody too close or going too fast, or distraction, uh, especially. Um, they are just 100% lucky. There is no skill involved with being able to handle that distraction or uh, following too close, something like that. There's no skill that's going to prevent that accident. You're just lucky. And sooner or later, your luck's probably going to run out. Um, mm -hmm. no, Brian, and Brian, uh, when it does, it's devastating. Back back in the the mid '90s, you know, PTSD um, incidents like this, mental health, it wasn't taken nearly as seriously. Yeah. So you have had 25 years now to sort of reconcile this event. How how have you processed it over this time? Well, you know, in the in the beginning, it was definitely a situation where uh, there was some depression that went in. Uh, I was not, I didn't work for a couple months, but. At that point, it, it, I was pretty much given an ultimatum that I needed to go back to work and support my family or there was going to be some harsh consequences. And I will be happy to say that, you know, my wife did stick through stick through that with me and we're still together. And but it was it took me a, a while to get back in the swing of thing of just going to work. And I didn't go right back out on the road right away. It was about a year and a half um, to go back out on the road. and. Still, once again, at that time, I went to work for a small mom and pop carrier and he threw me the keys and said, you know, your first loads to Chicago. And it was horrifying. Mm. So I can understand why a lot of drivers don't come back or a lot of drivers try and come back and can't because it was a very traumatic experience going to Chicago and just, you know, shaking in my boots. But from that point on, it, you change the way you drive. And I probably, I may have been even to the point where I was a nuisance on the road because I was giving too much. And, um, I was driving scared at the time, mm -hmm. but oh, now, uh... but now through the time, through, through the years to answer, to finish answering your question, um, I use it as probably one of the most impactful training tools I have. So what message do you hope that drivers take away from this? What, what, what can we give them here? The, the big thing is, is it doesn't matter how big the accident is. It's who it affects. And when we know that the industry already has a um, image problem, I realize now after 25 years, it's quite possible that anybody that was within that family, uh, the gentleman and, and his wife that I hit were older. Um, so they probably had kids, grandkids, maybe even great grandkids and so on and so on. Still 25 years later, there's probably some people within that family that are very anti-truck. And, you know, I did my part to damage the image of the industry back then. Now, once again, I've been trying to fix it ever since. But there's damage that's been done. And, and I think that even though we say accidents are down with big trucks, it doesn't take that many to really put a, a black eye on the industry 
for a long, long time with a lot of people. Yeah, no, very true, Brian. Uh, Brian, people who want to learn more, connect with you, talk more about safety or learn more about Reliance Partners, where should we send them to? Yeah, you can go to reliancepartners.com and check out the, the website, or you can email me directly. I, I always interested in hearing those stories, sharing my story, um, even going more in depth. I know, you know, Tim, when we did it before, we had quite a bit more time and, and it filled that whole time. So brian.runnels at reliancepartners.com. Uh, like I said, I'm happy to share those stories and, and talk with anybody that wants to talk about them. Yeah, thanks. For, Brian, I'll have to get you on my, my other show, Insiders in the Future. It's a longer, it's a longer format, and I think that this is uh, the kind of thing I'd like to definitely like to unpack a little bit more. But I appreciate your time today, and, your, and thank you for sharing that story with us. Drivers out there, drive safe. It only takes a couple seconds, you know, looking at a text message. Yeah. Looking at your just, cassette player. That's exactly right. 25 years later, it can still be impacting you. So thanks once again, Brian. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. Oh, again, we'd like to thank our friends at Legend Transportation for sponsoring today's episode. Legend partners with strategic customers while providing seamless solutions for its drivers and is West Regional's premier freight transportation company. Learn more at Tell Them, dude. Hey, go to newlegendinc.com immediately after the show. Now it's Trent Broberg, CEO of Assertus, and he's going to be talking about are the best vehicle logistics companies really tech companies? This is, uh, you know, we talk about logistics in general. You're seeing that that complete change in that little merger, a little bit spaced. I'm not as familiar as a trend. Talk to me a little bit about this. Uh, Assertus, I was looking through what you do, and I think that maybe one of the best ways to get the audience on the page is who do you, who do you serve? What, what do you do and who do you serve? Is it like the retail consumer? Is it the auto dealership? Is it the OEMs? Yeah, that question is a little bit rhetorical, I think, these days as everybody's leveraging technology. But thanks for having me, Tim and, and dude. Uh, by and large, we serve anybody that's moving auto logistics. We're a platform as a service. So we service OEMs to remarketing or used cars in the industry. We call it remarketing to fleet management companies all the way down to uh, you and I trying to move the vehicle. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> Other than OEMs, dealers, consumers, what's 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 hot in the uh, in the auto logistics right now? Yeah, uh, the big catalyst these days. A lot of questions I get uh, really on the home pickup and delivery. So you've got these likes of Room and Carvana, a lot of other digital dealerships and digital auctions that have uh, spun up in and and been a catalyst from from COVID. And that creates a lot of unique logistical challenges, whether it's a, a reverse logistics component from an acquisition of a used car from a house to a home delivery component, because frankly, less people or more people are, are more people are comfortable buying online and less people want to go into a dealership. Hmm. So what we're offering is really that white glove service uh, to pick up store prep, uh, truck it across the U S wherever it may be in Canada and, and, they could stick the landing within an hour of your house or, or office. Wow. Can, can you help people find cars? Used car market's tough. I turned in a lease last month and they, um, they didn't want anything to do with me. They kicked me right out. They didn't want me to be like, Hey, I'll buy it for the, <laughs> the value sheet cost. Oh, right. They were so, I'd never been at a dealership faster. That's right. It's an interesting time. I mean, I, I don't think anybody's ever, this is, this is new to chart uncharted territory with the supply chain disruptions going on. I can help you find uh, an F-150 that's silver, if you like, in Phoenix, Arizona. Everything's for sale, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to get one of those lightnings? Did you put a deposit down? I did. I did. I put a deposit down. Yeah, absolutely. I see, see how it comes out, and, and uh, obviously it's, yeah, I'm not beholden to anything. So what, what is the biggest change in terms of when we talk about uh, automobile logistics and we talk about digitizing it and bringing tech into it, what are some of those changes that you were seeing in that space that is going from the, the analog or the physical world to the digital? Yeah, great question. I think uh, what's been interesting, I've spent about 20 years in the logistics side, primarily in the freight and trucking side of the business, and I've flipped over to the auto logistics. And it's a little bit of a laggard with technology. So uh, what's nice is I've seen this movie before a little bit. And I think the, the big uh, component here is really in the communication uh, between, uh, you know, those that are doing the logistics and those on the shipper and, and the carrier side. So uh, obviously uh, inventory, inventory in motion, as you guys uh, would know it from the freight side is visibility. Uh, that's a big component, a big leverage. Everybody wants, it's a big asset. You're purchasing a vehicle. Everybody wants to know where it is and when it's going to be there and, and ultimately when it's going to get picked up as well as uh, really the communication. 
our philosophy is to be the easiest to do business with, which is really meeting our customers where they're at, means API-driven technologies, which means connectivity into their uh, digital DMS, digital ma D, uh, uh, dealer management systems or OEM systems on the SAPs and Oracles and things like that of the world. So, uh, John, when you get into the um, Trent, when you get into the uh, consumer end of things, right, and the the Carvanas, sure. et cetera, that type of stuff, there's a reverse logistics component to that, no? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of these digital dealerships are are purchasing remarketing cars, or they're selling remarketing cars or used cars. So they've got to acquire a vehicle. Uh, that's a big step that that we've taken, where we've got 55 facilities across the U.S. Uh, where we're intaking those vehicles, we're doing a full inspection on those vehicles, you know, using uh, the latest technology and making sure that, that whoever's purchasing the vehicle, they're aware of what the condition is. Do they need any of, uh, any of our uh, services that we can provide, whether it be, you know, uh, like upfitting or other things that we can do to the vehicles. But yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time because you've got to go acquire that vehicle and you can't take a nine car hauler in most neighborhoods. I don't think the uh, HOAs would appreciate that or even be able to make a turnaround on that. So you've got to, you've got to use drive away. There's a big component between trucks, full trucks, class eights to uh, flatbeds to drive away programs where we've got, you know, W2 drivers that are actually going into these uh, uh, and picking up or delivering vehicles. So you already pre-ordered your Lightning. So I got to ask you, how will EVs and EV compliance change auto logistics tech needs? Yeah, it's a great question there. Uh, it, what's been interesting is that Tesla is obviously provided, and you've got some others coming online uh, right now with Rivian and some others that are actually doing home deliveries, right? They, they've uh, kind of removed the traditional dealership approach and the logistics from the OEM, in this, in this case, all the way to the, uh, to the dealership or the home delivery is much different. Uh, we've got to be more precise with our pickup and delivery times. Because as you know, with Teslas, they don't have a large lot. So you can't just store vehicles. So you've got to be more JIT service to deliver because they can't store a lot of vehicles uh, at their location. And the same is true as you see that more EVs coming out. They're going to adopt a very similar model that's, uh, uh, you know, it's a much less asset, less asset intensive uh, solution. Yeah, so talk about the 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 tech and the importance of it in the in the industry. You know, when I thought when we talk about it, it seems like it's pretty easy. You move in a car, you drop it at the auto lot or whatever. Or like you said, you can't just take it to someone's house, but it seems like you could to the average person, but you can't. Can you talk about those things and why tech is so important to this? It seems really complicated. Yeah, it starts. What you do is you, you're multi layered here. So you've got obviously a trucking component, potentially a flatbed component or wedge or hot shot, as you know, in the freight environment. And then you've got obviously the, the drive away component, which is you or I getting in the vehicle and driving it to its pickup or destination or to its destination. That whole layer and understanding what the needs are of the customer at the specific time and understanding what mode you're actually delivering to the customer, that's a proprietary technology that we've delivered. We've, we've acquired a few companies recently where we've stitched together these services to be able to offer uh, logistics as a service platform to really plug in anywhere, whether it's a digital dealership, an online platform, an online marketplace. We're doing a lot of work with the car gurus of the world and some other some other big companies out there that are really focused on these marketplace uh, initiatives. Uh, so it's just really stitching that together to deliver a service that meets the customer's needs. As you can imagine, if it's an end, it's an end consumer, they're very interested in knowing where their car is. They're very interested in knowing what the quality of the vehicle is when it del when it's delivered to their house. So that's a much different component than you would have with freight, where uh, you know you've got obviously B two B play. Trent, I saw on LinkedIn that you were hiring. Join the club. I, I think everybody's hiring at the <laughs> moment. Uh, what's the recruiting and hiring market like right now, though, in, in your space? That's really challenging. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of components to that. If you look at um, our drivers, that's probably one of the bigger challenges. We've got a really unique offering out there where we actually have W-2 drivers on wow. staff. So you've got a gig economy to compete with in the Ubers and Lyfts of the world. But really, you can kind of join uh, Assertus and and really get a steady, you know, a nice steady pay and and understand what you're going to be doing and where you're going to be going on a regular basis. So it, it's a good competitive advantage for us. We've just got to get our name out there a little bit more than we are today. Uh, and then across, we've got the same challenges everybody has, you know, especially with the frontline workers and, and what we're doing there. So 
Uh, I think there's a big competitive market with talent density. That's a big opportunity for us as we're trying to trying to just look across uh, the entire company and, and, and our customers and just understand what the needs are there. Hey, Trent, how do people reach out? How do they learn more? Uh, CertisDelivers.com. That's your best way. Uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and and uh, and try to try to be present. So if you have any questions, obviously reach out to me. And and like I said, AssertusDelivers.com is is your best place. If you need any moves, Auto Logistics moves. Give us a call. Give us a call. <laughs> give us a, yeah, I or, like the pun. Or an F one fifty or a silver F one fifty in Phoenix, Arizona. He's selling it. I bet it'll move quick now that you've been on this show. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hey, we better see you in Chattanooga, November 8th to 10th, down at F3. I will be there. I okay. promise. Right on. All right. If you guys want to come to in the audience, live.freightwaves.com, click on F3. Use promo code WTT. You'll save yourself $200 on that ticket. Right? 200 beans, It's a man. good time. As you said, we- everybody's going to be there. You get to hang out with us. Right? Well... Without further ado, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the former Missouri State Campus Recreation Man of the Year 2013, it is none other than John Calloway, (laughs) the ice cream man. Wow, where is he right now? What's up, John? What an introduction, guys. I appreciate that. (laughs) Now, a lot. How uh, I one, forgot that, that was on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> how does one win? Uh, what is the recreation, man? You just you're, you're the best at like react, relaxing, taking it easy, n- not studying. You know, one would assume that those were my responsibilities uh, <laughs> once I won that award, but <laughs> no, uh, it had to do with intramural sports and being you know a washed up college baseball player uh, after retiring from one year of college. Uh, on the athletic side. Uh, so it's like I the Heisman of intermutual sports. Ah. Pretty much, yeah. There that's a good way to summarize it, yeah. I played all the sports. I'm a huge <laughs> fan of minor league baseball, and there's something I saw in your background. I used to work for, you used to work for the Baby Birds, right? The uh, Who are they? The, the minor league Springfield Cardinals. Also, I believe they're affiliate yes. for the, the major league, the St. Louis Cardinals. You sold a little bit about that. What, what goes on when you're selling for a minor league team? Uh, you're trying to sell entertainment more than you are baseball. I'll tell you that much. But as an employee at, uh, again, the double A affiliates of the, the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, you wear a lot of hats being in pretty much any role uh, with a minor league baseball club. So whether it's selling tickets, creating flyers, coming up with event ideas in the middle of innings, uh, wearing those silly costumes, you know, I'm talking about where you can barely see through. You know, and they're oh, yeah. seven feet tall, and you run around to the uh, warning track in them. Yeah, you got to like race the presidents or something sure. like that, right? The sausage race. Yeah, or the sausage yeah, race. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. You do. You do wear a lot of hats, and you know, I've, my day, uh, I had some fun from that. Well, Young hey, kids. Uh, when bit. I go to the <laughs> baseball park, John, I like to get a little ice cream. Now. Logix, they do oh, yeah. a little bit about with the uh, the logistics of ice cream. In fact, your team wrote on LinkedIn that the average American eats 48 pints of ice cream per year. Wow, 48 pints? Yeah. Whew. I can do that in a week. Somebody's hot- eating like 100 of them to make up for my lack of eating pints. You don't eat ice cream. cream at all? Not 48 pints, I tell you. I that. like ice cream too much. Tell us a little That's a lot of ice cream, isn't it, That's guys? a lot of ice cream. <laughs> what goes into the yeah. logistics of ice cream? What's the back end behind it? Now, how does that cone get in my head? <sighs> Sure. So when you look at the actual product and just take a step back and I'll give you a little idea of how Logix stumbled into that. So being a young company, right, started in January of 2020, we're, we're in the heat of the pandemic rolling out. We need to find areas that separated us from, you know, other players in the market space. So we started looking at commodities that, you know, most brokers and carriers, they don't like to touch. Ice cream is one of those. It's high risk. It's easily damaged. Uh, it, the operating cost associated to maintaining the quality of the product is very high, whether it's warehousing and transit storage at retailers. So when you stick your hand in that freezer, you know, any, any person that owns a home or pays utilities knows the colder you keep your house, the more your bill is going to be. And with ice cream needing to be stored at negative 20 degrees, it gets very expensive. So when executing as a, let's say, shipper, an owner of ice cream product, you got to align the carrier's expectations with your goals as a company. And even furthermore, unless you're a mom and pop shop on Main Street, right, just scooping out that ice cream, uh, you're probably selling into big box retailers, right? 
you know, your targets, your, your Walmarts across the board, that's your target market. Um, so, you know, this logic goes for any motor commodity, but when you're looking at ice cream, again, the expectations got to be communicated between the, the customer, the carrier and the, the broker, which would be Logix in you know, this context. Yeah, crazy. You know, it, it, if you watch, uh, you know, Shark Tank. Yeah. There's one of those sharks that's not, If you walk in there with a new thing of ice cream, yeah. Mr. Wonderful's not investing. Not interested. Because exactly what he's talking about. The 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 logistics of it, the expense are incredible. Well, you're talking about if you go to econ, right? Direct to consumer, you're talking about expensive shipping because you got to use yeah. dry ice. You got yeah. to put boxes. And you're talking about yeah. getting into the big box. When you put in trucks, you got to use reefers. Uh, reefer market, pretty terrible right now i think we have some sonar stills let's we do a- have some sonar stills here what are you guys seeing uh there john because we're, we're looking at this and we're seeing the volume reefer volume is actually uh the movement is actually uh coming down what you're seeing there right now is the van in in the fuchsia and the blue is the sure. reefer volumes across this the the u.s and it, it is uh you know it's affected definitely by produce and we still got southern california northern california sorry lettuce and that type of stuff going crazy but uh the uh reefer volume seems to be coming down right now what do you guys see in there you know a lot of our uh customers in the reefer cold chain space the commodities that we are moving uh range from ice cream floral so just your standard flowers that are going to nurseries Mm -hmm. uh craft beer and for us and the way that we engage with most of our carriers is in a dedicated uh environment with pretty steady volume and a lot of our customers have the ability to forecast very strongly uh, but going going back to what I said about setting up expectations, uh, from the beginning, you know, we're aligning capacity strategies with uh, our customers' goals from the beginning, and those service level agreements, you know, we got to be pretty strict on, uh, or we're going to fail on the service side. But speaking towards the data, uh, you know, when we do, you know, fall out of that uh, dedicated environment with those dedicated carriers. You know, this year has been odd, right? A lot of seasonality that normally happens historically uh, has differed this year. Right? What are we looking so at? You look at like the data. Dry van, it, it is rate per totally mile different. versus uh, reefer. Yeah, this is. So the, the fuchsia again is uh, dry van, and then the blue is reefer, just looking at the, the rate per mile, right? And, at and for those who don't know nation, all the terminology, dry van is just your regular 53 yeah, your regular foot trailer stuff. truck. And reefers are the cold storage yep. trailers that are, are, are environmentally right. controlled. And at 348, and it was, you know, and that's coming down, right? It was, it was much, much higher. It was yeah. at fours and close to fours. In some markets, five. We've seen five dollars, yeah. et cetera. How are you managing those dedicated, right? They they gotta fall out and say, man, I gotta go get that five dollars every once in a while, right? You know, Hopefully, we have a strong enough relationship and pretty deep level of rapport with those carriers where they're not going to be coming back, uh, you know, let's say three months into the award saying, I need more money. You know, when we sit down and onboard carriers with dedicated uh, solutions, you know, we, because carriers are our customers too, yeah. right? It's not just the people that own the freight. So when we communicate to our shipper customers, we are very upfront about, hey, here are the operating costs, like just for that truck to move. Here's what our carrier needs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously we have to build our margin into that. Uh, But with the, on the flip side with the carriers, we say, hey, we're going to go to bat for you, right? We're going into these, these uh, shippers moving product into major retailers on your behalf and letting you know, hey, figure out your operating costs. How much do you want to make? know whatever that metric is per load per mile per week figure that out and let's develop a solution around that so you're happy and so we don't have to go back to the customer and ask for that five dollar mile mark way down the road yeah that, it, establishing that partnership up front is yeah. ice cream doesn't seem like the kind of business you want to get in if you don't know anything about the logistics it sounds like it can be a challenge you know it's it's what's really been coming up though recently and this fedex thing kind of prompted it but we've heard other companies just <laughs> fedex is so big um usually we have people yeah. that are talking about their growth strategies right they're trying to bring yeah. customers in um fedex some of our other guests they have said that they're not necessarily eliminating customers right but they are putting pricing tactics in there to discourage 
certain lines of business, certain lanes, certain things like that. Have you had to, have you had to take a step like that to discourage some partners that maybe not be the best partners in a market like this? Yeah, we've had a few, and you know, in those situations, we're getting pushed to lower our costs to them, right? Because you know, if you talk to any company out there, what's the first uh, area within their company that they look at to cut cost? Logistics and transportation, yeah. for the most part, right? So they're coming back saying, "Hey, we got to get here. We got to get here." Well, at that point, you're driving us to operate in the red. You're driving the carrier to operate in the red. And it's those types of conversations when we see those types of uh, that dialogue being developed. That's where we cut ties. Uh, but yeah, I think for us in a positive light, we've seen a lot of growth because of those conversations. And you know, we talk a lot of suppliers talk about consultative approach, right? And I think what really separates us is we gave you that consultative approach. We're developing solutions specific to you. We're not handing you this box and saying, here's all 30 of our solutions, pick which ones you want, right? So every day, you know, as much as we do specialize in the cold chain space, we're developing new service lines uh, on a regular basis. Send Excellent them to the stuff. wheel, Vincent. Oh, yeah. You're going Spin that you're thing. off to the wheel, my friend. Spin the wheel. Make the deal. No, what are we no. going to get? Uh, dealer's choice again. Dealer's choice again. You're in charge of an upcoming, uh, 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 of coming up with, sorry, you're in charge of coming up with a game day minor league baseball promotion. What is it? Oh, man. Can it involve food? Yeah. Sure. Like, Whatever you want. Yeah. Like all you can eat Chick fil A chicken sandwiches? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That sounds like it'd be right. expensive. I mean, that's a nice prize. Where do we go? That's, could it get expensive? Yeah, you didn't tell me my budget. So I'll take box seats. That's, that's our mistake. <laughs> Make sure you let you let John at Logix know your budget. Hey, John, what's your website? People want to connect with you. Absolutely. Our website is Logix, Inc., L-O-G-E-X-I-N-C dot com. And if you want to email us for more information, you can email info at Logix, Inc. dot com, and my team will get back to you. Thanks, John. Take it easy. Excellent stuff. Have a good one. All right. Thanks. Time for a little good news, bad news. People are like, why is it today? It's not Friday. We're not here Friday. Friday That's why it's today. The news. If you want to go inside the newsletter, just subscribe to the newsletter. Go to FreightWaves.com slash WTT. You'll get it every Wednesday night at 630. And you know what? It's one of those things. We're going to get the inside scoop on stuff. We're talking about ice cream today. But you know that pallets he was talking about? Yeah. We were talking about that 30, yeah, 45 absolutely. days ago in the newsletter. Yeah, that's right. Get the latest stuff in there. Actually, Lordstown, a little takedown on Lordstown in it this week. The inside Dogs of Lordstown, Lordstown, I think you call yeah. it on the After yeah. uh, Lords of Dogtown. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> Good movie, right? I loved it. I loved it. All right, yeah. bad news. So a pipe bomb was reported in Tuesday in Marquette, Michigan. It was sitting on top of a FedEx drop box in front of the postal office and federal courthouse building on Washington Street. Local businesses and residents were evacuated after someone spotted this. They just freaked out. Unbelievable. Well, here's the good news. Bomb. Here's the good oh. news. Look what it is. Is that a pipe bomb? Some of you might recognize this thing. It's not, right? It turns out something many drivers will recognize. No, According no. to it's TV6, the Michigan State Police and local canine unit helped the MP. I like how the canine unit helped here. The MPD yeah. determined the object was not a threat to the public. The, the dog was like, hey, I used to ride with a trucker. Yeah, and his the dog's going, eh, yeah, that's not a so. bomb. That ain't no bomb. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can't, you look here. If you've never seen that in your life, I could maybe see what the confusion comes from. MP, yeah. MDP Captain Mike Lorilla, he said, it's a document cargo holder that is typically affixed to the back of semi-truck trailers that holds, for example, registration work and things like that. It's a tubular device with calves on both ends, so that was our concern at the particular time, that it wasn't some type of explosive device. So we wanted to make absolutely certain that it was, in fact, safe before we rerouted traffic back to normal and allow people back to their business. So no harm, no foul. Yeah, no harm, no foul. And, and you know, even the, the, there's bad news again, though, in that, because okay. they couldn't figure out whose it was, even though they've got the yeah, registration right there. right there in the article they said they go to. Anyways, bad news. It's 1.30 in the afternoon. You've been driving down Erie Boulevard and Seneca Street in Schenectady, New York. I know oh. you know the area very well. When you coll- not that bad. Yeah. And when, then you, <laughs> when you collide with a cement mixer, my friend, oh. you hit a cement mixer. And to make matters worse... The thing's got cement in it. And a collision starts the wet cement flowing down the chute into your car. And you are, there it is. Look at this. And you are, uh, are you, you're, man. Ay. So you got a good possibility of being entombed. But as you can see in this picture, the good news is, luckily <laughs> enough, the motors and cement truck were both removed from the scene with minor injuries. 
Uh, if I think it'd be a different story if that was a uh, convertible or had a moonroof open. Well, he's on the phone right now telling somebody about what, yeah, what just happened. You but can't believe what just happened now, to me. Any situation where there's cement in a car, it reminds me of what Stone Cold Steve Austin did to uh, Vince yeah. McMahon back yeah. in 1998 yeah. on WWE Raw when he poured the cement mixer right in his convertible. But here you go. So this story made me think about that. So I started looking into it, and I found yeah. out that on uh, auto, uh, according to AutoEvolution.com, during the pandemic, that Corvette was actually found. So oh, yeah. like 20 years later, happened 1998. What is it now? 2021 or 23 something. Yeah, years or something. Know. Yeah, something. something like that. 23 years later, they find this in a warehouse about 50 miles away from where the event took place, and uh, it's growing a little garden in there. So, yeah, that's uh, so. Why they why they turn it into a garden? I don't know. I'll put a link to that Stone Cold Steve Austin segment too. We didn't want to play it during the show because I'm not. You know, YouTube can be a little touchy with these things, but it's a good one. It's a good. One. All right, good yeah. news. Tommy Woodward. He's a 28 year old. He's at Burkett Burkhart's Marina near the Louisiana state line. He's planning on jumping in and taking a swim in the bayou. There's yeah. just one problem. Oh yeah. Bad news. There's a sign posted that says no swimming with alligators. According to witnesses, Tommy, don't play that. He removed his shirt. He removed his billfold. Someone was shouting at him uh, and warned. They said the sign's up. There's a 10-foot alligator that they just saw roaming around. Don't do he it. He goes, F the alligators. You know, he, F the alligators. <laughs> and he jumps right, And that's a direct quote. But yeah, I, I even is. censored myself. He said, F the alligators. He takes, uh, he takes off his shirt, his billfold. Who's a billfold? A wallet? Yeah. Okay. That's it. Is that like with like a click, a money click? It's your dad's uh, okay. wallet. <laughs> Apparently he has a bill. He's my dad now. <laughs> and then he jumped into the water, right? Um, some lady, as he jumps in, she goes, please do not do not go swimming. There's a bigger alligator out there. Just please stay out of the water. Well, soon yeah. after he jumped in, an alligator bit him, took him underwater, did the roll, and that's, there's no more Tommy. No more Tommy. They no found his Tommy. body later. No more Apparently Tommy. it was at night, too. I know. And we just, you know, we just... <laughs> Went around telling everyone recently that alligators, like, they're always in these situations, but nothing ever happens. Well, <laughs> not when you jump in. When they go to Wendy's, maybe not. But when they jump well, in, yeah, when you no, jump in their house, maybe yeah, so. Yeah, because they're not swimming, and it's not night, and they've already eaten a bunch of Wendy's, so you're in good shape yeah. there. But shoot, fire, They say, don't go swimming at night. That's when they hunt you. Yeah, that's when they're hunting. Yeah. Who yeah. would swim with alligators at night? I, I, I uh, if you're not from, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. So, hey. Good news. Nature yeah. is healing. Oh. Lockdowns are lifting. Yeah. If you haven't California noticed. Yesterday. Huh? California yesterday reopened. Oh, yeah. There you go. Drop Excellent. And people are getting back to old normal. That includes Royal Caribbean and live events F3 this November. Yeah. Uh, the cruise line had scheduled its first pandemic, post-pandemic maiden voyage for July 3rd. Coming it did. Up. Right? Bad news. It's been post postponed until July 31st after oh. eight vaccinated crew members tested positive for COVID-19, the company's CEO said. All 1,400 crew members Odyssey uh, on board the Odyssey of the Seas were vaccinated on June 4th and will be considered fully vaccinated on June 18th. The mm -hmm. positive cases were identified after the vaccinations uh, was given and before they were fully vaccinated. So somebody forgot to remember that, hey, once you're vaccinated, it's not that immediate. Window. It's, yeah, there's a window there. Royal Caribbean's vaccination policy requires all guests 16 years of age or older leaving from U.S. ports to be fully vaccinated, excluding ships leaving from Florida because, well, because Florida. Starting August 1st, all guests 12 years of age or older must be fully vaccinated. Younger travelers who are not eligible for the vaccine may sail with the negative test results and must follow certain protocols. The company said, you going on a, on never, a cruise? Never. I'm not interested in cruises. They, I find, the, uh, kind of, I don't, I just rather fly to like Costa Rica or wherever and just hang Amen. out there. All right. Bad news. Apparently word around some truck stops is that truckers won't have jobs because, and I quote, people saying truckers won't have jobs soon because Tesla made a self-driving semi. Tesla screwing up. Well, good news. At least mm. one TikToker, not named Wayne Craig, isn't taking it very seriously. Let's take a look right here. She's uh, she's shaking her, her booty. Well, she's crying at first, but uh, you know what she says? She says she don't care. She don't care. She got hair. She don't care. She's dancing. She's putting the moves on. And here's the thing, people. Drivers out there, don't be worried about these Tesla semis. For one, they're not even coming out yet. They don't have the batteries yet. Um, yeah, right? No. They don't even no. have the batteries yet. And they're the even ones the coming out. Postponed it. The first one's just electric. It's not even self-driving. So just, just calm down out there. Trucking's still a good career. Still a good career. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. India. Not, uh, speaking of careers. Yeah. No, yeah. Speaking of, hey, there's bad news out there. People need a job or need a career change. Yeah. I got good news for you, what my friend. It? Freightwaves is hiring and it's awesome. Check it out at freightwavesinc.apply to job.com forward yeah. apply. Okay. 37 and jobs. Go there. Open. There's 37 jobs open and you got to go check them out. There's a great list there on our yeah. website. 
get hired at Freight Waves. Get 37 jobs. If you want to join the logistics industry, now is the time. You need to switch. Now is the time. Freight Waves, we got 37 open. Easiest entry gate into that media data side. You just want to work in logistics too. All these companies we talk to, they're hiring too. Everybody's hiring. You hold the cart. Play them. Play them. <laughs> All right. Find me on Twitter at Tony Duda, D O N E R. Find me on Michael Vincent too. We'll see you back here on Monday. Thomas Healy on Freight Waves Insiders coming up Thursday. Tell them how to be. Peace and love, everyone. Spread it everywhere.